and I just saw um, yeah, entrapped people basically living out a life that they think is going to get them to heaven but yet they are so broken and damaged. The problem with the utopia is it's not a Christian utopia for the victims. It's great utopia for them. It's not Christian, but it's a great utopia for a sex offender. Kia ora, I'm Gwen McClure, and today on The Detail. After all those decades that the secretive West Coast community of Gloria Vale has existed, why hasn't the abuse been stopped? And how have New Zealand women and children ended up in an offshoot of Gloria Vale in southern India? Last night, the third episode of TVNZ's Escaping Utopia documentary aired, revealing the existence of a Gloria Vale outpost in India. Theo Pratt featured on that documentary and spoke to me about her experiences. Walking in to that community over there was, yeah, I didn't know what I was going to see and what it was going to be. Um, and I had prepared mentally for the worst, like in my head, but I don't think like you can't prepare yourself for, for what we saw. And just seeing my sister for the first time, and I think it was 11 years, um, and she was like just like a shell of the person I remembered as my sister. Like it was a bit, I was very taken aback, like it didn't, expect it to be that bad and just like her response and just yeah she was so lifeless I guess. Thea was born in Glory Vale and left about eight years ago at 18. Last year she went to India to check on her sister Precious and the rest of the women and children living there. Precious is my older sister she's she's 30 with six children. We were very close growing up like I grew up with a sister she was like the bossiest person ever and like very outspoken and knew what she wanted. And then I saw her and I was like, this is not my sister. Like, who is this person? Um, what, yeah, I just hadn't prepared mentally for that. Um, but yeah, that was her reality every day, living the way she was and the, like no future for her or her kids. How many families are there? So there's five um, New Zealand women married to Indian men and there's about 35 kids with from their families and then there's a couple of Indian families with a couple of kids. Um, the oldest uh, child from, like, the New Zealand woman is th- around 13 and 14 and... Faithful's plan is definitely to get them start getting them married off around 16 to each other. Faithful is the leader of Glory Vale in India. He came and lived in New Zealand from the age of 11 or 12. Um, yeah, so I had met him and known him. Um, but yeah, I hadn't known, I hadn't seen him for a long time. Yeah, it's all like bigger picture plan to start breeding those kids and he had he had pictured that within 10 years there was going to be 100 people and so this yeah those kids and those women are hugely at risk I believe it was faithful said something to you in one of the conversations about defining rape and what rape meant what did he say and what did he mean by that He, he, I think he knew what I was going to bring up. And so he brought it up first and he straight away went to rape, which was really shocking, shocking to me. Um, and, it, and he, he's like, what is rape? And tried to say that if a woman doesn't scream out for help, then uh, it's not rape. And so then... Yeah, he was trying to say that nothing's happened because, yeah, women haven't asked for help when it's when there's been abuse, and so it's it's not rape, it's not it doesn't meet what rape means. His relationship in terms of how he viewed those women to him was very 
weird, like not normal at all. Practically, I mean, it's, this isn't just a um, an issue of the psychological entrapment, but also people don't even have their passports or, or birth certificates. Is that right? No, that's going over there. We discovered that like they don't have access to their passport. Like they're not kept with them. Like they don't have them. And the kids don't have birth certificates. Um, and they pretty much don't leave that community, like very rarely. Um, and like it's hard enough, for example, like it's hard enough for us when we leave Gorovala, New Zealand. But imagine if or one day my sister wanted to, or any of those women wanted to leave and bring their families back to New Zealand. There's no way they can do that. Like, it will take months to organise that. And by that time, Gloria could have easily convinced them not to go, or there's just so much at risk from doing that. So it's not really an option. The existence of Glory Vale in India is news to most of us, but it shouldn't be. I've been trying to find a way to get the government and to get someone to, I guess realise what was happening and what Gloria Vale were doing with sending women to India, um, especially with um, one of the women being my sister. And over the years I've met with like human rights people and lawyers and media people and at the end of the day it was just like it was in the too hard basket and no one was going to touch it because it's Gloria Vale and it's so complicated. And so never really gotten anywhere with it. Um, when you say over the years, how long are you talking? Um, since 2018. Wow. So about seven years now. Is that when your sister went over? No, she went over in 2012. So she's been there since then. Um, but it was pretty much from when I left. I sort of settled myself and after about a year sort of – keep trying to find a way, Googling different organisations and getting in touch with different people in the government to try and find someone to listen and look into if it was right, what was happening and, yeah. What do you think needs to happen? Who who needs to get involved? The government needs to step in and work with the Indian government to make a plan to bring the women and their children back to New Zealand. Um, I think it, it's very urgent that it happens now because, I mean, the kids are only going to get older and and Faithful's big plan, the leader in India's big plan, is that he's going to marry all these kids off to each other and start them having kids. So... When that happens, there's sort of no way of getting them back to New Zealand. So it re- something really needs to be put in place now to find a way to give those women the opportunity to get, come back to New Zealand to live and their children. Rosie Overcomer left Gloria Vale 11 years ago. She went along with Theo last year, but it wasn't her first visit. Um, I'm a little bit unsure when it officially started as a community but I think that they started connection with um, India about 2004 um, because uh, I went over as a teenager to help at the orphanage that they were supporting at the time and then that fell apart um, and then they bought land and set up their own community and that would have been before 2008 because my husband and I went over shortly after we were married to help um, at that community as well um, for three months. So, And then you just went back. What did you see? Um, I, the community had barely changed in the 11, I oh know, how long ago, uh, 14, 15 years now. Um, that I had been there. Um, So, I mean, there was a couple of new buildings, but mostly people were still living in the same quite um, terrible living conditions as they were when we lived there. 
Um, and I just saw, um, yeah, entrapped people basically living out a life that they think is going to get them to heaven, but yet they are so broken and damaged. And I, I don't like, oh, my heart it, it just it actually breaks because they think that they have chosen to live that life and they think that they are doing what God wants and that's why they keep living like that. But it's it's so bad. And, I mean, I don't know if you know this, but they've also tried to replicate that in Kenya again. But um, that hasn't it actually, that hasn't eventuated. So there's no New Zealand people over there. And I'm pretty sure, I'm not 100% sure, but I think that is getting wrapped up, tied up. They're not still sending money over. So, um, yeah, I think. Here in New Zealand, there are about 600 people living in Gloria Vale. There have been several recent court cases dealing with the community. Rosie has gone along to some, including a recent case, which Gloria Vale lost, about whether Gloria Vale's women are volunteers or employees. Women who still live in Gloria Vale testified on behalf of the community. Women who Rosie knew, who still defend and support their leaders. I asked Rosie for her views about that. It's not surprising at all. Um, and it's funny because you can sit there and you can feel a bit annoyed or um, angry about the lies that they that are coming out of their mouths. But at the same time, I I see them as me. Like that was me 11 years ago and I would have done the same thing. And so I have um, not a sympathy but like an understanding of where they're at with that. So... Do you believe that the women sitting there defending those leaders and defending the practices are actually making their own choices? No, I don't. Um, and as I said before, that was me, you know, 11 years ago or maybe a bit more before I got to that point of leaving. But um, anything, any, I can't, I'm trying to think how to explain this best, but living in Gloria Vale, any thought, opinion, um, inkling that I had that I knew like as soon as the thought passed through my head that it was against what the leaders had taught me I would immediately shut it down or shut it out um, refuse it to um, like become a, an actual thought and because who was I to question? I wasn't as good as them. They were called of God. I had no right to have an opinion. So it's not, it's not free choice. It's. I think it's a hard one for people to grasp that um, the amount of power and control that is over your life when you're in Gloria Vale um, restricts that ability to make decisions or choices. What role do you think New Zealand? has and the New Zealand government has in protecting the people who are in there? Oh, do you know, I think they've known for so long about this stuff and they just turn a blind eye or they put things in place to make it look like they're doing something, but they're actually not. It's just, a, um, it's like ticking the box um, to the public. And I mean, I can be brutal here and say they have enabled Gloria Vale to become what it is. Um, and they have given them the tools to run a system that's not just illegal, but that is damaging New Zealand citizens. So, yeah, they've got a role um, that they've played and played it well for Gloria Vale. Gloria Vale's in their mind for their sake. It's the government has supported them. Um, but. Yeah, it's time for that to stop. Brian Henry is a barrister who's acted against Glory Vale in a number of cases, including that employment case. Yesterday, Brian was in Wellington filing proceedings in a new claim against the senior civil servants who were part of two committees monitoring Glory Vale. He agrees that the government is failing victims. My problem is, I've got these victims as plaintiffs now. I see the damage. And I believe they're entitled to some remedy for the failure by government to step in when they know things are going on. You know, there's a police report which got on the Official Information Act to this committee 
saying that the police are investigating Gloria Bale on the basis of slavery. Criminal slavery. That was last year. So what has the welfare agencies done? And the police say, oh, we're looking at criminal slavery. These guys work on the civil burden, not the criminal one. And they're sitting there saying, oh, the police are doing this, isn't that great? What about the victims? Nobody thought, what about the little kids that are there? They're sitting there today. And there's nobody doing anything about that organisation that I can see that's credible. How has Gloria Vale been allowed to operate for as long as it, it has and continue to behave as it does as an institution? Well, there's two questions that come out of the television program it's running at the moment. The first one is, what's someone going to do about it? Well, the answer is, uh, that was filed yesterday, and we are going after the civil servants who, from 2.15, are supposed to be doing something about Gloria Vale. The reason we're going after them, and that's the second question, is because they've come up with a program to assist Gloria Vale to reform. They've got five points signed off by the Cabinet Social Welfare Committee or some committee of that nature. Those five points are to let Gloria Vale continue. Who's looking after the victims? What is in these people's heads? They're trying to help Gloria Vale change. What about the victims? They're little girls. Right now, there's a six-year-old girl in Gloria Vale who is not being educated, being trained into the teams, and everybody's sitting doing nothing. So someone has to wake up to the fact that this is an abusive organisation deliberately created by sex predators. We had a big apology two years ago after the boys' case. Oh, we're sorry, we didn't know what was going on. The man who released it is now charged with sex offences. Work it out, government, and wake up. So are we just missing the legal frameworks, or are the institutions that are supposed to work to protect people, like Oranga Tamariki or the police, are they just failing? Well, let's start with the police. I have no criticism of the police at all. They're operating under the strongest mafia and murder system I've ever seen in my life. The job they're doing is incredible against absolute terrible odds. So full marks to the police, no criticism at all. But the police are reactionary. They deal with offences that are committed. They're not thought police and stop future stuff. They do prevention work, and they've been in there trying to do prevention work. It comes to the people who know what's going on who have got a social welfare responsibility to look after children being abused. And they have utterly failed. Now, this committee isn't a police committee. Yes, police sit on it and feed information to them, but the police are limited as what they can hand over until they charge people. But take example. Last week, the school teacher got 11 years. He's got 30 years of predation on children. And yet... What's going on? The answer is we're coming after these civil servants. I'm going to identify every one of them and we're going to sue them because they haven't done their job. It feels like attention is escalating. Do you have... Only because of our litigation. See, our litigation's embarrassed them. The government said they're not employees. Well, guess what? I've got two judgments saying they're employees. The government was saying, oh, no, they're volunteers. You know, they're... Mary Poppins or Julie Andrews and Sound of Music running up and down the hill singing the Sound of Music. That was absolutely false. And the evidence we led showed that. And we've got reports where they're saying, oh no, they they come out and they change their minds. These people coming out are victims giving evidence, telling their story. They ignored the evidence of the leavers because the shepherds were saying, oh no, we're lovely. We're good Christians. We don't do that. Now they're saying, oh, we didn't understand. Now they actually call the defendant. It's just criminal neglect on the part of those agencies in my mind. And the fact this government has now abolished that committee and are going back to thinking it through from basic things, it's about time and we'll see what they do. But this television program that the public have just seen is explaining what's been happening for 50 years. 50 years. 
I phoned the Gloryville community and spoke to Peter Righteous, a senior leader there. He told me that their general policy is to, quote, turn the other cheek instead of commenting through the media, and if someone has a complaint, they prefer to deal with it directly. Righteous also denies that there are New Zealand women trapped in India, saying they have passports and can leave at the drop of a hat. As to Brian Henry's allegations that Gloria Vale was founded by sexual predators, Righteous told me he wasn't going to enter into a public debate through the media with the lawyer. However, it's a matter of public record that founder Hopeful Christian, who has now died, was a convicted sex offender. The leader who took over from him, Howard Temple, faces 14 charges of indecent assault and 13 charges of doing an indecent act. He is awaiting trial. A police operation at the community, which began in 2021, found more than 100 potential victims of crimes spanning about 40 years and brought to light offending involving 60 people. The 400 suspected crimes range from low-level physical assaults to serious sexual offending. Four detectives are working full-time on the investigation, which is ongoing. Here's Theo Pratt again. As long as those children are living in that environment, they're at risk. And you can't make a basket of rotten apples good again. And it's gone too far. Like, there's too many messed up people. And, I mean, at the moment, the next generation, like, the generation living in there were born into there. They don't know any different. So they don't have the standard of what normal is living the way they're living in that toxic environment where consent isn't a thing and mental health isn't a thing, is it's not going to change. That's all for today. The detail is funded through RNZ and NZ On Air. Thanks to Theo Pratt, Rosie Overcomer, and Brian Henry. This episode was engineered by William Saunders and produced by Alexia Russell. I'm Gwen McClure. Kaki Teano. <laughs>